All right, welcome back to the Polonize podcast. My name's Mars, this is Sharov. We're here at Fortress Melbourne, one of the largest esports venues in the Southern Hemisphere. Thank you to the team here at Fortress for having us. Uh, it's been, yeah, it's been great being in the center, center of Melbourne again. Sharov, how are you doing? Very good. How are you today, Mars? Uh, awesome, awesome. Feeling good. We're in some new digs. We're ha- having a bit of fun. Yeah, yeah it's great. absolutely. Always yeah. having fun. Yeah, exactly. Got a lot to get through today. It's going to be a fun episode. Let's do it. Uh, yeah, I guess I, I wanted to start. We've come a long way over the past year, over the past six months. And Polonize is, is a machine that's moving in a fun direction. We've got players playing. We've got people getting jobs. We've got employers uh, running campaigns and getting great global talent. Uh, but there still seems to be a stuck point in the industry itself. We, we come up against it. We're doing something new. We're finding uh, some resistance within the industry itself. And I wanted to illustrate that by a few stats in the hiring industry. And we'll go from there. So one stat is only approximately 25% of resumes reach human recruiters after passing through ATS systems. What do you think about that? That's just crazy. It's like, crazy. how did we get to this point mm-hmm. where you're, both sides of the job market are doing something they actually don't want to do? No one wants to write the resume and we're increasingly automating it. And no one wants to read the resume. Exactly. This is insane. Yeah. It's broken. It's totally broken. <laughs> Which another point illustrates that only 14% of hiring professionals dedicate more than a minute to reading a resume. Absolutely. I remember doing an event about this Mm. with a bunch of employers with the American Chamber of Commerce. And they had a stat that was very similar. This was five years ago. And it was even worse. Seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, Mm. people glance at the resume. Actually, you can feel this when you hire, uh, as we are using our own, you know, process. I've actually been testing this out. I've been trying to use the old way to hire. I've been looking at resumes. Mm. And I've got 210 resumes in my inbox right now. Mm. How can I look at them for any more than a few seconds? It's insane. Totally impossible. Yeah, I remember doing this for my father's construction industry a while ago and you end up being totally subjective of of how you uh, sort your resumes. I remember I was looking at Hotmail addresses. If anyone had a Hotmail address at that time, I absolutely despised Hotmail because they were full of, it was full of scams. And that was the thing I said, if you had a Hotmail address, I'd throw you away, which is totally ridiculous. Yeah. And I hear that from recruiters a lot that it just, it gets, you get totally burnt out. It's, it's decision yeah. fatigue. I don't blame you for not looking at resumes when you have hundreds to look at. It's mm. not the recruiter's fault. It's the system that's broken here. Yeah, totally. No one can be expected to do this. On LinkedIn, you can only see the top little bit of the resume, maybe the first third of the first page. I guarantee most people don't look past that. So you've got your name, what font you use, and maybe one line. Mm. (laughs) This is what you're getting judged on as a candidate right now. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of the, how would I say it, uh, recruiting influencers, uh, which we'll have a look at in a second, some of the different uh, resume uh, strategies that they have Hacks, in order yeah, to yeah, yeah. in order to hack your way through <laughs> not only the ATS system but when you get an actual human to look at your resume, what's the best way to structure it? Because they're only going to look at it for ten seconds. This is a classic sign of a broken market when there is an industry to hack the way that things are. Mm. If there's a whole bunch of people teaching you and making money off hacking the system, that means the system is broken. You know what this reminds me of? When I was a kid, I used to go to India. Uh, we're an Indian family. And in those days, it was incredibly difficult to get a taxi. The, the taxi system was totally ad hoc. And if you stood at the side of the road, you couldn't get a taxi. So in your local neighborhood, there would be people you would pay to stand on the road and get you a taxi. And you'd have to give them like, you know, 100 rupees or 10 rupees or whatever it was. But they would get you a taxi. Same thing would happen to go to the movie theater. You would get someone to stand in line for you. That's how broken that system was. And mm. imagine now, compare, I just went to India and I used Uber. Mm. I got every Uber within three minutes where exactly where I was standing at the side of the road. Yep. That's the difference between the job market now and the job market with Polonize. Yep. Right now, we're, we're hiring taxis on the side of the road. <laughs> we're waving. That's exactly. how people are trying to get jobs. That's how people are trying to hire. Yep. And that brings us to the next point, which is that both sides of the market are trying to use AI to fix the market, the problem in the market, but it's just exacerbating the, the core problem, which is that resumes are faulty at their core and you can't speed that up by adding AI. As yeah. we've seen, AI is great for accelerating particular processes. It is an accelerant in itself, but if you put it to work on the wrong thing, it can exacerbate the problem. Absolutely. Look, I'll tell you what is wrong right now with the hiring industry as a whole. We are addicted to process. Everyone always is talking about adding to the process, 
improving the process, using AI to speed up the process. Here's the dirty secret. No one actually wants a process. We're just doing the process over and over because we've forgotten what are we here for? There's only one thing that matters. Great candidates getting great jobs. That's all that matters. A really, a, a really great job needs a great candidate. What does a hire or want? A hire or wants a great candidate in an interview hired. That's the outcome. No one actually wants the process. We've forgotten why we're here. So adding AI to the process, the process is the problem. Mm. And let, well, let's speak about that pro process because I think that's, that's quite interesting. So at the moment you have, let's start that process from the beginning. Someone identifies that they need, there's missing talent in their team. So they need someone to fill that role. What happens from there? Yeah, and they do this thing. We call it a job description, a JD in the industry. So that's your uh, effort as a hirer to write down what you want. That's absolutely necessary, of course, because you're the one hiring. No one else is going to be able to write your JD for you. I think it's insane, for example, in some companies, HR is writing JD for the teams. This is the most stupid thing I've ever heard of. How the hell will they know what you want in your team? People giving away power to their HR departments, you've already lost the game. Now, once you've written that JD then you go into the machine, here's the process. You know, here's your HR taking control, taking that JD, taking that into their recruiters who are then doing talent acquisition. They need to find sources for that talent. They're using all their different types of methodologies. They've got tooling, they've got ATS, tra applicant tracking systems, they've got AI, they've got resumes coming through and this whole machine is starting up. But actually, the only thing that really matters for you as the hirer is, I've written a JD and I want great candidates to meet. And then I'm gonna hire one of them. Mm. In the same way, when I stand at the side of the road and I say, I need to go to your house, Mars, all I want is someone to turn up and take me there in a car. As Maybe as possible. In the, in the near future, there won't even be a someone. Yeah, exactly. All I need is the A it's to B, something. right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just need to get there. And everything else in between, you know, where to stand, which taxi to call, which the best com company, what's the best time of day to hail a taxi. Like this is, what we're doing now. We're just trying to improve the broken process of getting a taxi. So yeah, going through talent sourcing, talent acquisition, resumes, all of this stuff that recruiters are doing and spending money and you as a hirer are spending money on now is actually missing the point. All you want is a great candidate. Yeah. I'll say it again. Yeah. And ATS systems are rejecting up to 75% of qualified candidates due to resumes that are difficult to understand. So Hence again, we're getting into that area where you've, you're, you, you have someone that's super talented and now they have to work out this skill of writing a resume. Yeah. So they're just getting good at the skill of writing a resume. Yeah, which has nothing saying, to do with the job, no, right? No, so what we talent. do is we say, go through the job simulation. The polonized job simulation is exactly the job that you're gonna do. Now, if you're good at that and you can compete and beat everyone else, then you get the job interview. So you've got people competing on the job, for the job. Totally makes sense. Mm. Anything else doesn't make sense. People competing to write es resumes to do the job doesn't make sense. You're competing to write resumes. That would make sense if you hired them as resume writers. Resume writer. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only job yep. in which writing resumes makes sense. You see what I mean? Yeah, totally. You don't, you know, when the, um, have you seen that movie Gran Turismo? Mm. Mm. My kids have seen it. They love it. What's the whole point of the movie is you learn to drive in the game and then you drive. It's a simulation thing. And it wouldn't make sense if, Formula One was recruiting people from a flight simulator game, mm. would it? They'd be getting great pilots behind the wheel of their race cars. It's, it's insane. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. Yeah. So that's where we are. And that's why uh, I, I actually wanted to show you a few things. Oh, I, I wanted to show you one uh, specific ad, which illustrates exactly that. Illustrates that when you have this situation where... Uh, you have inefficient processes that then get exacerbated by technology like AI. Yeah. You get innovations like this. This is a quick ad. I just wanted to watch this and get your comment on it because I think it's quite interesting. Let's do it. This is for an ad, an ad for a product called AI Apply. Give me a second. Market is right now and how exhausting it can be to send out so many applications and create so many custom resumes and cover letters. However, that is why I use AI Apply to simplify this process for me. Literally, all you have to do is upload your resume and add the link to the job that you're applying for. And AI Apply will automatically generate a job-specific cover letter, resume, and follow-up email for you. This has made the job search and application process so much easier for me and allowed me to apply to so many more jobs to increase my chances of getting an interview. You're putting in a link of a link to the job, your resume, and it does it for you so you can apply for more jobs. You can apply for jobs at scale. Like, yeah. I don't 
I don't think people understand how, rid- how ridiculous that concept no, is. They don't get it. Well, l- let's look at it in a couple of things. Here's my reaction to that. First of all, you've just made the job market into spam, essentially. Mm. That's what's happening. The job market is now spam. You know, you, if I get 1,000 applications, that's spam. I'm sorry. It's as simple as that. If I get 200 resumes, that's spam. If your recruiter sending you more than five resumes, you've got a spam totally problem. Spam. Yeah. 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 That's just making it worse. It's decision overload if you're trying to read that. Think meeting. about the hirer experience. Okay, the candidate feels like they've just applied to 100 jobs. Now the hirers have got a f- inboxes full of, full of spam. Number two, and I feel this when I hire, if you know that people are just automating your application, then you're getting people who don't actually care about your job. Some of them haven't even read your JD. And this is only getting worse. You put a JD, you put your effort into writing a JD. How many people do we have stats on? How many people even read the JD? Do you know I have people trying to apply for jobs they haven't even read the first five lines? Yeah. And th- this is just making things worse. That's how broken it is. It's gone spam on both sides. So we're trying to get spammy ways of getting jobs and there's hirers are trying to, trying to somehow source their talent using these tools and getting spammier about that as well. Mm. And this is, on a, on a larger scale, this is a problem we're seeing across the board that AI is creating a level of content, a level, a level of digital information online that that spamminess is happening across the 100%. board. And, and to be able to filter that out, filter that out, and understand that is is a job. There's that, look, there's only one solution, and that's what we know the solution. The only solution to spam is how do you stand out when everyone can play the game? Mm. Performance. Think about sport. How many people play soccer on earth? But how many people are in the EPL, English Premier League? Not even point zero 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 one percent. How do they get there? They perform, they perform, they go up the levels, and at every level, it's about performance, it's about competition. That is the only way that you're going to get ahead in this job market. Right now, if you're a smart kid, you're intelligent, you're passionate, and you're above average, you can't stand out. You're just another resume. Mm-hmm. I, I remember feeling like this. I was a good engineer, I was good at school, I was good at my first job, but I really got disheartened because I couldn't stand out in the job market. It flattens everyone mm-hmm. and we're all resumes. That's the human side of that. That's what it's doing to the best performance, discouraging them and it's pulling them out of your talent pool and you're not getting to meet the best talent. Mm. And on the other side of that, it is uh, an elitist game in the sense that uh, if you look good, if you have the connections, if you have the right things to write on your resume, all of a sudden you're standing out against other people. Think about the amazingly talented individuals that we've met over the past few months from the global south, amazingly talented individuals that have no chance of standing out any other way but playing Polonize because 100%. on paper, they, they, they can't compete. A hundred percent. Like, let's talk about India for a second. The IITs, the Indian Institute of Technology are the Ivy League's universities of India. You have that on your resume, you've got the status mm. that gets you a foot in the door. Tiny, tiny proportion of Indian students and grads go to IITs. So when the market is saturated, people come up with these rules of thumbs and heuristics to deal with the spamminess of the market. And one of them might be exactly that. You're just going to look at who went to an IIT. Let me just hire that guy or yeah. interview that, that person. What we find is, of course, in Polonize, a huge number of talented individuals who didn't go to the top schools. No one else can find those people. Only we can. So we're missing out. We're missing out as a as an industry on 99% of the world's talent. This is a huge problem right now. Huge problem, yep. And we've seen it. We've, we're, we're hiring uh, talent for our own company using Polonize. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Some phenomenally talented individuals coming Absolutely. through. Absolutely. Yep. I've been hiring salespeople in India. They are so good when they come through and they compete and they become our champions. And we end up interviewing in the first five or 10 minutes because of the Polonize game, I know they can do the job. Mm. And I know they're elite champions at that job and my version of that job. And a lot of them would never have got through a resume process. They don't have the fancy university degrees uh, Mm. and and the fancy logos that get them ahead in the Indian job market. The Indian job market right now is just as broken as anywhere else. In some ways it's worse because status is such a huge thing in India and there's such a massive pool of people in India Mm. that the problem's actually worse over there. The kids and the grads and and, and the students, they're all fighting over trying to get ahead and they're all using these hacks. They're all trying to get into the top universities and that's driving all sorts of bad behavior. People are stressed, there are suicides. The whole thing, education into work, is just a terrible experience. And let's be clear, it's not the recruiter's fault. The, the recruiters hate this as well. They're just, they're just a product of the, of the system itself. So I know this because 
we're hiring at the moment for talent partners in Polonize who yeah. help bring in talent into the campaigns. And they're essentially, we're essentially hiring them from the recruitment industry. And the first thing they have to do is play a Polonize campaign in order to, in order to understand what's going on and in order to, to have that experience. And they absolutely love it. They, they yeah. can, when they play the campaign, we have recruiters saying, this is just a breath of fresh air. This is yeah. amazing to experience. And it's something that they wish they had to, to use as a recruiter. Yeah, but look, let's be clear. 30% of recruiters like Polonize and 10% of them love it. We end up recruiting them. They become our talent partners. 70% of the industry doesn't like Polonize and I would say some of them really hate us. Why do recruiters hate us? They're trying to protect the model that they have. Don't forget, recruiters make a lot of money right now out of the status quo. We talk about the problems, but they're profiting from the problem, some of the recruiters out there. Mm -hmm. So we know it's not the whole industry. Some of them are dead set against us, right? Yeah, for sure, 100%. And on that note, let's switch gears a bit and uh, jump into a weekly deep dive where we'll have a look at each other's feeds and dive into some of the topics that we've been speaking about within our community over the week. I think that's a good place to go from here. And specifically of what you said there, I wanted to address one particular post. I'll start from there and I'll hand you over the phone. This post here, tell me about that. Yeah, so this is, let's get tangible about the costs of recruitment as it stands now. What you've got here is the top five recruiters in Australia. These are big companies and how much they charge you on these average salary jobs. You know, So these different tiers of jobs, 50K, 80K, 150K, right up to 300K. And how much are you actually paying for one candidate for each for of one those? Candidate. One candidate. Now, they've, the cheapest, of course, at the bottom end of the scale, something like five to 8,000. That's already thousands of dollars. Up to, if you're looking at these more high level jobs, you're paying up to 50 to even $70,000 hmm. for a candidate. You know what this is like? If I said to you, hey, Mars, it's $50 for a cup of coffee, hmm. what would you say to me? I'll tell you to, yep, to get. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say for the you YouTube censors, but I'd probably tell you to get. To yeah, get we, we can always edit it out. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> if, I, if I said to you right now, $50 for a cup of coffee, what would yeah, you say to I'd me? I'd probably just walk off. Of course you would. Yeah. That's what we're doing right now. Hmm. And you don't know yet that coffees are actually $5. Yeah. <laughs> as soon as you've bought one coffee for $5. And, and it's gonna, good. What and it's, are you quality, it's a quality yeah. cup of coffee. <laughs> but right now, we are paying $50 for a cup of coffee. Mm. 10 times more than what we should be paying. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. And look, these recruiters are doing well. It's a competitive industry. It's not that they're not sourcing new candidates. But again, if you're getting that taxi after half an hour... Maybe you, you just don't know it's even possible that you could get a car to drive you within three minutes to your destination. That's what technology does. Yeah. Think about the technological shifts in history. We went from CDs, $30, $3 a song, and then we went down to MP3s, which was like $1 a song, and then we went to streaming. So we went from $10 down to $1, and then we went to streaming, which is let's say $0.10 cents or $0.01. Cent. Every time these shifts come in, you get a 10x reduction in cost. That's what we're doing right now. And we're not devaluing the product. We're just saying that there's a cheaper way of finding the best talent. That's, that's, the, that's what it comes down to. Not yeah. devaluing the talent. No, exactly. In, in fact, it's the other way around. Right now, because we have this high touch, broken way of doing things with all the resumes and everything, you're getting the worst of both worlds. You're paying to try and fix a broken system and get a candidate through despite the system. Mm. Now, here's an example. If you hire someone, if I said I need a great engineer and I go to you, one of these top recruiters, you will say to me, all right, I'll find you an engineer and I'll give you some resumes and you're going to interview them. It's going to take you weeks, maybe months, um, and it's going to cost you in the end something like $20,000. That's, that's my purchase decision at this point. Now, how do I know that out of all the engineers out there, I've even got one of the best. How do I know? I don't know, mm. do I? You could have just given me, maybe you have an Excel sheet of 20 people and you just gave me a couple of those guys. So there, are, there is a problem already in the sense that there's no visibility, there's no transparency. And so I'm actually not even able to really know if I made a good decision or not. What am I actually paying for? You're not just paying for a candidate, you wanna get the best. Especially, I mean, if you care about your company and your performance, you want the best. Mm. And you that's also any. illustrating one of the major issues in the recruitment industries is this idea of uh, ghost jobs, is that recruiters are putting 
fake jobs up on platforms like Seek and LinkedIn, etc., in order to bulk out their uh, their resume, their their uh, their, their play pools, their uh, candidate pools. Uh, so when they get a job, they can basically just go, okay, these guys are engineers, send send them to them, collect my money, done. Yeah. yeah. So see how the system is incentivizing bad behavior, mm. poor behavior on both sides. It's starting to really break down. You've got deception on the candidate side. You've got deception on the hiring industry on, on, the, on the business side. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's not good. It's not good at all. Let's keep, th- let's keep di- diving deeper. Give me another post. Well, actually, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, me. I, I reposted something you, you talk about here, Mars. I really loved what you wrote this week about resumes are dead. Mm. Uh, and there's one line in particular. Let me, let me try and find this line. Though. I really like this line. Um, well, the, actually, there's a couple of good lines in here. But you said resumes are like reading a restaurant menu rather than eating the food. Tell me about, yeah, tell me about that. <laughs> I, was, I was reaching for, a, for a, a good analogy and that's, that's, the, that's a great one. It's, just, it's that feeling like when you sit down at a restaurant, you're hungry, you're looking at the menu, you read this, you know, twice braised salmon uh, in <laughs> butter with, uh, with, with broccolini and all, all of this sounds amazing. You get the meal and it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's, great. Not, it's no. not great. And that's, yeah. that's the experience of reading a resume yeah. is you're, you're reading the best possible bullet points uh, that someone has written about themselves and their experience, yeah. which is most likely total, total bullshit. Nothing to do with the food, right? <laughs> the food. You're reading the yeah. menu and you've forgotten that you're there to eat. Yeah. That's the job market right That's now. It. Exactly. Actually, it's much better uh, on my local street when they give you a little sample. Mm. My butcher gives you a bit of sausage. Yeah. That's how I know that's a good sausage, right? Yeah. You've yeah. got to be careful when you go to pet stores though. I was, I was in line yesterday and the guy in front of me, <laughs> there was uh, dog biscuit samples on the, on the <laughs> counter and he just assumed they were human samples and he grabbed one and ate yeah, well, this is why it's happens. important to know why, why you're there, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and that's what we do in Polonize. You're there to be an engineer. You're going you're gonna to sample the engineering job. You're hiring mm-hmm. engineers. You're going to get engineers playing your job simulation. It works. Yeah. But right now, that's another problem with the market. You've got people eating dog biscuits. You mm-hmm. know? Exactly. I mean, uh, again, using the old process, I'm getting all kinds of applicants who are not even fit for the job, mm-hmm. applying for the job. Why? Because they're just spamming me. They're using tools like AI Apply. Mm-hmm. Also, yeah. just... Uh, in LinkedIn itself, you use the quick apply button. People don't even actually read no. the read, read the resume. You know what it is? It's too easy itself. to apply for a job. Mm. It's yeah. too easy. When you make something too easy, it becomes useless to everyone. Yeah. There's, it's got to be hard. Mm. It's, there's no value unless it's harder. Exactly. And I was, I was talking to an Uber driver the other day and he mentioned that. He said he sat down for up to an hour every day and applied to at least 100 jobs. And I, and I thought of that for a second. I thought, oh, that's a lot of work. Poor guy. But then I thought, no, no, he's just repeating the same thing yeah. because the industry has made him do that. And he's obviously not having success. He's just been trained. You've been trained like a monkey to just hit the quick apply button. Yeah. yeah. That's what LinkedIn's done. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, look, let's talk about the other end of the scale. Let's talk about something inspiring and a, a, an industry which does care and does things differently. Let's talk about space. Mm. Now, the space industry is undergoing huge change right now. And Torsten Hoffman a documentary filmmaker that we know in Germany has done an amazing job of this by making a film called Fortitude, um, the new trillion dollar space economy. That's the title of his movie. And it shows how startups and cohorts of talent from different countries are now transforming the space industry. It's not just um, the typical space scientist in NASA anymore. So space is the most, one of the most elite industries in the world. You are sending people to space, you want to make sure they're the best. And astronaut training is, is one of the most you know, grueling things that you can think of because they can't afford to make a mistake. Now, this week I was talking a little bit about one of the scenes from that film which I found really inspiring, which is Torsten was speaking specifically about our, our university students at the Swinburne Institute of Technology. Now, Swinburne's actually my local. It's in my area mm-hmm. where I live, Hawthorne here in Melbourne in Australia. Um, great university, very forward thinking, and they have actually got students doing space experiments on the International Space Station. Like, what an amazing opportunity. And think about the kind of talent that is going to come through from those kind of programs into the industry. So we can learn a lot by looking at the best. Just like in sport, you learn by, if you're playing tennis, you can learn from Federer or one of the top players because they've been through it and they do it at the elite level. And in the same way, looking at the way that industries like space think about talent i think there's a lot of value in that yes especially because there's, there's a there's quite a low margin for error there you need you need the best in in those situations so 
Yeah, I haven't actually watched it yet. Something I have to. It's something I yeah, might check out might watch this, movie. this, we'll put, this put, week. Yeah. yeah, definitely put the download link in. Um, you know, I do want to. What you just said there is interesting. Let's go back to that, especially because they want the best. You said. You know, mm. one of the things I think that people uh, forget is that it's not just the elite space companies in the world who need the best. You also need the best. You could be running a software team in your company right here locally, for example, but you also need the best because good performers, great performers, elite performers, are the difference between a successful company and an unsuccessful company. It's a competitive market here. Let me give you one example. If you hire mediocre, mid software developers, you are gonna get mid software. And if you create mid software, then your product is not going to make money in the market. It's as simple as that. People forget this. Makes sense. It's not just the astronauts of the world. You know, next week I'll be speaking to one of the biggest software companies in the world about how to build a great software team. And this is how I'll start. I'll talk about sport. I'll talk about elite performance because in sport we get that. Now, we need to build our teams the same way. And that makes even more of a difference when you are a startup with a small team and every person in that team is such an integral part to the flow and the success of that product and of, of your growth. Yeah. Uh, you need those superstars in that position. Yeah, and this is a big problem for startups. Startups using traditional hiring is, is a problem because the talent at early stages is critical and good mm. investors understand this. Good VCs know that you need to get the first five hires 100% right because they will power everything else. You're launching, right? Mm. So. How do they do it? Well, they have to use recruiters. They have to use networks. They have to try and game the system. There's no good way. And this is something we've seen. VCs care about talent. Uh, VCs care more about talent sometimes than the founders because they, they need to get talent into their portfolio companies for those companies to launch and make money so that they can get their returns. Good VCs get talent almost more than anyone else. Yeah, again, it's, it's exactly like that sporting analogy. They, they understand that you need, the good, you need the best players in the field in order to get the best results. That's good VCs, but mm. there are bad VCs. Bad VCs don't get that at all. Definitely. And they'll, they'll fill their, you know, we, we've had the experience of investors giving us poor advice. Mm. If you've never hired for a startup, then maybe you shouldn't tell the startup how to hire. You should just focus on giving them an environment in which they can find great talent. Mm. They'll find it. They know their job. They know what they're hiring yeah. for. And we've felt that viscerally. We, we wasted probably $200,000 on bad hires because of that exact thing because... Yeah our investors told us to do something that was fundamentally incorrect at that yeah. point in our growth. Yeah. And we, they didn't give us the tools to succeed in order to, be, uh, in order to make the right hire at that time. In fact, we didn't need to hire at that time, but yeah. they forced us to. Yeah. And that was, that was detrimental to our growth at that point. Uh, it, it hugely was. Look, I, I think this is calling out something interesting, right? You know, when it comes to hiring, who's the expert here? Like a lot of people are experts. You could be an influencer, you could be all over, maybe you've got 140,000 LinkedIn followers, maybe you're a talent acquisition global Specialist. thought leader. <laughs> yeah. Sure, okay, you've been around the traps, you know something about the industry. But when I'm hiring an engineer for my team, I'm the expert. It's my job, I know what I want, not you. So when you hire, you're the expert, not that guy. People forget that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, agreed. Let's keep diving. All right, so we're just going through our feed here. Is this my feed? Is it? Doesn't look familiar. <laughs> Let me try my feed. That was, that was other people's <laughs> feeds. Other people's. That was interesting, but it had nothing to do with hiring. <laughs> Which is LinkedIn in general. Yeah, and then I'm going to let you go through your feed, Mars. But um, we talked about process. So this week, I, had, I think this is a historic moment. The first time ever that someone's used the word recruiting process and fun in the in same, the same sentence. <laughs> <laughs> I challenge anyone to find an, an example of that yeah. on social media. It's, it's happening often with us and that's, yeah. that's been fun. Absolutely. That's this is one, one particular player, candidate, who came through and uh, wrote back to me and said it was unique and challenging. Unlike any other recruiting process, also a lot of fun. Mm. This is something we find with our best players, the uh, champion elite talent that comes through Polonize, they love the challenge. They find the challenge fun. Mm. It's, you know. Yeah, that, that's, that raises a, a great point. Something that we've seen is, yes, Polonize itself, when you play the campaign, you see these skills play out over time. You see uh, great candidates shoot up the leaderboard. 
but there's this other intangible element to someone's personality. Uh, you could almost call it their uh, what would you call it? Their their ability to their their tenacity, their their ability to to to, to push against adversity. Uh, it's interesting seeing different candidates come through, even geographically, and how differently they react to a challenge. And I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I can I can viscerally feel that Western talent, people from the West, are absolutely lazy. They're getting more lazy by the day. They're entitled and they think they deserve something without putting any effort in. And you only real, realize that when you put them up against talent from the global South and you see the tenacity that some of these candidates have and some of this talent has, and then you put them side by side and you realize that, no, actually, the global South has some superior talent. Yeah, 100%. Look, it doesn't get said, but it's true. You know, I mean, if you're in a situation where you expect to get things without effort, then you're going to end up being lazy. You're going to be entitled. And you're probably going to be angry as well. This is the interesting thing. Like we talk about elite talent. Let's not forget at the other end of the scale. We see it all at Polonize. The best talent goes through and gets interviews through Polonize. And a lot of people are in the middle. But the worst talent uh, often ends up coming back to us and, and complaining, don't they? Mm. They say, why are you making me do this? Why should I play a simulation? Give me an interview. Give me a job. I've had a, I had a guy the other day say, no, you can just give me the job. <laughs> what, what sort of attitude is that? And where yeah. is that going to get you in life? <laughs> exactly. But he could probably send a lot of resumes, mm. right? Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, you know, if you're one of the best in class, then you want a way to stand out. And that also means that the worst performers, the ones who don't turn up, the ones who don't make an effort, they need to, they need to go. Mm. They need to go. Yeah. And even to build on that as well, there's, even those that may not have the specific skills you're looking for, if they have the right attitude, it's already 90% of the job done. You, it's easier to teach someone the hard skills that they need in, your, in that specific role for your specific business than it is to t teach, teach them an attitude. Absolutely. It's, it's very difficult to change someone's attitude when that, once they... No, you can't. And you know, the, some of the horror stories I see in software, they're yeah. exactly like that. You know, when a, uh, when a space mission goes wrong or when a, when a yachting trip goes wrong it's not because they someone can't operate the boat or the spaceship it's because of some sort of team failure so this week we spoke to one of our investors and a good friend aj milne who is going to sail around the world i believe mm. um amazing guy yeah Phenomenal. super talented and he's in training right to sail across the southern ocean and he said exactly this aj said that uh, the, the biggest risk a disaster he said actually the word he used a disaster is when there's some sort of team conflict in the middle of a uh, a race. Mm. That's how things go wrong. Not because someone doesn't know how to operate the jib or the sail or the, or the technicalities. And it's the same thing in a software team. You never, ever, ever get a problem in a team because someone doesn't know how to code. That can be fixed. Mm. You need to learn a new framework, you can learn it. You need to learn the new language, you can learn it. It's always because of breakdown in communication, because of lack of collaboration, because of a bad attitude, can't work with other types of people, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And I keep making this point again and again and again, and I'm standing up on stage and I'm going to make it again, and I'm just going to keep making it because the industry needs to get this. The industry needs to change the way it thinks about hiring software engineers. It's completely us backwards right now. You don't screen for technical skills and then end up with people who can't work with your team. You simulate the job, get the people who can work with your team, then look at their technical skills in an interview. It seems totally logical when, when you say it. It is logical. <laughs> we just keep doing stupid things as an yeah. industry because that's the way we've been brought up to do stupid things in a stupid way. Look, there's a reason for it. Mm. In the early days when everything was about working alone and just doing that technical task in an isolated way, that's how the industry mm. worked. As soon as the internet came and now with remote work especially, it's the other way around. You're never alone, ever. Even if you think you're writing software by yourself, you're writing something that's going to be looked at by other people in the team and maintained and, and integrated. So you are never alone. Mm. Uh, That's an interesting point there about remote work. Another, another stat uh, from the industry was that 35% of candidates actually put preferred remote work on their resume, so there's a, which was up by about 25% from last year. So obviously post-COVID, the idea of remote, working remotely and having that flexibility is a lot more appealing for candidates and for workers. But as we've seen recently, uh, Amazon, 
have commanded that their staff as of next year, five days a week back in the office. And so this tension about hybrid, remote, all in the office is still alive and well, and it's, it's a difficult one to solve. But it, I think it, at the core of the issue is that employers feel that when they give their employees that autonomy to work from home, they're less productive and yeah. they're distracted. And that, that's, there, there's a point there. Uh, but it's what's the solution to that? Well, it, that's only a problem because we don't have visibility right now. You don't know if that person can do remote work. And by the way, that person's saying, I want remote work, but they can't show you that they're good at remote work either. We don't know how to look at people's performance. How do they communicate? How do they get tasks done on time? How do they respond in meetings? How do they work with the systems you have? And remote work is a very different environment to what's historically been work, mm -hmm. right? What we do is we simulate remote work. You sit down and polonize, you go through the real feeling of being that guy in the team doing that thing. So as an employer, I can now see, hey, Mars is actually good. You know, he wrote a great message, it was very clear. I can see that working in my team. I'll get him in, he's a good communicator. Normally now, right now we don't have that. So we're hiring people blind and they're selling themselves as remote workers, but they have nothing to back it up. You could mm. be getting a dud. Um, I did see a great post though about mm. Amazon. So Amazon said, you know, five days back in the office, but they're still a hybrid company. You work five days in the office, you work Saturday and Sunday at home. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> stealing that from LinkedIn. <laughs> as, as most, as most uh, people do. Uh, let's switch gears for a second. I wanted to jump into a segment I'm calling only funny because it's true. Uh, but I'm going to show you, I don't think you've seen these. I've pulled together a few, a few memes. Um, I wanted to show you these memes because they illustrate uh, some some hard truths in a in a funny way. Starting with, starting with this one, can you just read that out? Interviewer, can you tell me about your tasks in the military? Me, I carried out daily biological decontamination at critical military facilities using a specialized mobile hydraulic dispensing unit. <laughs> it's only only funny because it's true. It's 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 illustrating that fact that. People love to exa exaggerate on their Because <laughs> what's he doing here, Mars? He's mopping the floors? He's mopping the floors. He's mopping the floors, <laughs> which is a task. But it's a task, <laughs> but it, it, it sounds a lot better when he puts it that way, that's yeah. for sure. You know, again, if you could just ask someone to show, show you rather than telling you, mm. then you'd see that they're mopping the floors, yeah, right? that's but all they're doing. Yeah. yeah, this is like, we all know it. We, we all know Every, it yeah. You know, this is, this is something everyone has to do right now because we have to write these resumes, you know? And even like LinkedIn profiles. Mm. People are spending hours on those things, right? Yeah. Like what are the right words to sell me? Yeah. And then you got coaches that are like LinkedIn yeah. specialist yeah, coaches. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. just, it's crazy. It all comes from being able to show, not tell. That's mm. what Polonize gives you. Yeah, exactly. Next. Next meme. <laughs> Life in ruins adds, adds archaeologist to resume. <laughs> Hits rock bottom adds <laughs> geolo ge geologist to resume. <laughs> Has a meltdown, adds nuclear physicist to resume. Yeah, love it. Yeah, this is also a thing, right? Like experience, what uh, where, what have you done? You, yeah, know, exactly. you know, imagine if a sports team recruited like that. Yeah. Imagine if they said, uh, you know, don't worry about playing basketball. Just like tell us. Tell yeah. Us. Tell me, where did you play? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I played at the local court, then I played there, and then yes. I played there. Uh, yeah, I was. Love that. Uh, it's, it's insane. It's yeah. insane. Next one. This one I love. Uh, so this guy. He put his divorce on his resume. <laughs> so he put, after his first experience, which was Bright Sport LTSD or something, Natalie's ex-husband, point number one, manage considerable emotional stress during legal <laughs> negotiations. Point number two, <laughs> negotiated, sorted, and distributed furniture and appliances from our <laughs> old house to a new home. <laughs> Uh, invented new scheduling technique between our family members to break the news in which I brought everyone together at once and just kept it real. <laughs> <laughs> and his last point, learned a valuable lesson. <laughs> yeah, actually he did, you know. You know, there's a truth in that and we're laughing, but yeah. it's funny because it's true. Yeah. Because actually there is lessons in experience and learning, but right now we have no way of talking mm. about, you know, what are, the, what are the skills you got from that experience at work, like no one talks about the right skills. All we have is this, I did this job at this, this yeah. thing. So and they talk about transferable skills a lot and you put those, you see those a lot on, uh, on <coughs> resumes, like hobbies or other things I like to do, which is supposed to show that there's other interests I have where I've learned great stuff that I can apply to my work, but it's not showing the, actually, the actual application of those skills in no. context, which is most important. Exactly. Skills in context. Yeah. 
Yeah. Look, I, I think last year we talked a lot about transferable skills, but mm. I've, I've changed my tune on transferable skills. Okay. Most, most skills are not transferable. Mm. Most skills are not transferable. I'll give you an example. You, you think you're a pretty, pretty creative guy, right? Mm-hmm. You are a creative guy. Mm-hmm. I've seen you in the studio. You can, you can put together some really good music in the studio. Mm-hmm. You're a creative guy. If I took you out of there and forced you into, uh, to, to go into my, you know, my little cubicle that I have mm-hmm. for coding and I said, hey, Mars, it's time to get creative. Here's a Visual Studio code and I need you to smash out some you know, back end, maybe, maybe some Node, some front end React code. Mm-hmm. You're not no creative problems. in that situation. I, <laughs> Don't lie. <laughs> I was about Wait a minute, to you're breaking my story. <laughs> no point. Wait, you can't code, right? Yeah. No, I can't. I can't. Context matters. Yep. Environment matters. You might you might have the potential to be creative there, sure, but you need training. You need mm. to be brought into that context. And yep. this is where we're at right now. We've got engineers claiming to be good communicators, or or salespeople claiming to be able to sell a product. They might have sold, you know, cleaning products. And you want them to sell your B two B SaaS software? Mm. Different kind of skills fish. are not transferable. Mm. I'm sorry, my friend. Mm. Yeah, it's going to make us a lot of enemies. That's truth. No, it's it's, it's true. It's true. It's, yeah, yeah, that's true. It's true. This one, you like this one? <laughs> <laughs> the HR lady who majored in psychology at a no name <laughs> school in Florida is about to throw your resume in the trash. <laughs> this is so true, man. <laughs> Like, okay, what does it take to be a recruiter? Nothing, right? You no, don't have any qualifications. No qualifications. Spreadsheet and a couple of phone calls. You're in, no. you're a recruiter. Mm. And they're the ones gatekeeping the best talent in the world mm. from getting to the best jobs in the world. What the hell is going on yeah. here? <laughs> what other industry do we have that? Are we finding the best sports players? Does the EPL find their best soccer players by sending out random kids with spreadsheets? Yeah. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah. How do we get to this point? I don't yeah. know. Yeah, it, it's, well... It's like you said before, it's a product. I think of I want to be a recruiter, system. actually. Yeah. We can do it. Let's just do it. Let's no, throw I've, away Polonize and imp- just get a spreadsheet. <laughs> Important point there, though. I think uh, because our history is not in recruitment, that's why we have such a fresh view on this. I think everyone yeah. in the industry are so entrenched yeah. in the ways of the industry, ah. they can't even see nah. the, these total fallacies that are happening. They're in the them. process. You yeah. know, I, look, I've been dealing with experts in recruitment now, and I love them. They're great people. And the best of them care deeply about humans. That's what I love about recruiters. Mm. They actually care about people. Okay. But they're all stuck in the process, the status quo. And it, very, very few of them, and there are some of them that we're bringing into Polonize, I would say 5% get it. Mm. The other 95% intelligent, but they don't get it. Yeah. They're stuck in the process and they the can't process. imagine it. Yeah. They can't imagine anything else. Yeah. And so those people are now actively hurting candidates. They're hurting businesses. They're they're pushing an old process into a new world. Yeah, and this is exactly, uh, you, you can see this when you look at recruitment tech in action. It's yeah. created by recruiters that have just added AI to the process yeah. that, they, that they already have and are just accelerating. They, the aren't, they aren't stupid enough. Hmm. You need stupid people like us. <laughs> it's okay. we, we, we have, you know why? Because we have the guts to change it. Yeah. Because we're not invested in the existing process. Yeah. And, you know, people just tell us that we don't know and we're not, we don't have 40 years of recruiting and we're not experts and it's true. That's why we can do it. <laughs> Bring it on. A couple more. Uh, so this is just, just to, to touch on that whole thing, like a whole slew of recruitment uh, influencers uh, yeah. looking at creating resumes to, you know, this one's got an ATS score of 85 and it basically teaching people how to get through the ATS scanners yeah. and the AI and the ATS scanners to, to get an interview, which is yeah. again, again, just so broken. It's so broken. You're training okay. people to game a broken system. Yeah. I hate it. Can't yeah. look at it anymore. It's <laughs> making me angry. I can't, I, I mean, how people even read resumes is beyond me. Yeah. Well, they don't. We just work that out. <laughs> yes. This one says, dress for the job you want, not the one you have, which is why I wear sweatpants to the office so they know I want to be a remote employee. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Um, anything else good in here? Yeah, it's just a slew of these kind of, you know, let hey, wait, us help wait, wait, your wait. resumes. Before, before you move on, yeah. I want to say something about sweatpants yeah. and remote work, okay? I go to my local cafe and I see some really intelligent people <laughs> rocking up in the most disgusting looking sweatpants <laughs> because they work from home, right? Their engineers are top companies and... But they, they, they don't think they need to wear pants. They can just wear the same thing they slept in 
No, it's not good enough. No, and I'll tell you why. It's not about the pants. It's about the mindset. Yeah. It's Agreed. about that mindset that says I'm going to be comfortable. Nothing ever good was done by a comfortable yeah. employee. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same. Uh, I, I'm, my mindset is dictated by the shoes I have on, which sounds ridiculous. <laughs> but if I put my, if I put my Marcos on, I'm, I'm home time. It's yeah. a different mindset, yeah. you know? Yeah. I, yeah, I put my boots on. It's, it's, it's this ready, is the worst thing. Work. The worst thing about the pandemic mm. is that it destroyed the separation between comfortable, relaxed mm. home time and switched on competitive mm. work time. Those two things are now all together, mm. which is why you have a whole bunch of people who can't perform in work, especially in those countries that have the luxury of having remote work. Yeah. I mean, you, you grew up in a poorer country. You had to still get out there and do your thing, but you grew up in a developed com- country Everyone got to, you know, it wasn't pleasant. I'm not saying the pandemic was good, but what it did is it got us used to this idea that I don't have to even get out of the house mm. anymore. Getting out of the house is a hassle. Yeah, it's supposed to be a hassle. Mm. It's supposed to be a hassle. <laughs> comfortable, it, comfortable engineers don't write good code. You need, to, you need to be switched on. Yeah. Just enough discomfort. You need to be yeah. solving a problem, right? Yeah. You need a mindset. Like there a needs challenge. to be a, yeah, a dynamic tension there between, yeah, the, between you and the problem you're solving yeah. in order for that to get done. Yeah. If you can easily switch off and go and make a cup of coffee or play with a dog, yeah, that, that, that's, a day, that's a slippery slope. Look, I, I'm gonna say out loud what a lot of hiring people in, in the technical industry say to me, mm-hmm. which is their remote workers are super unproductive, they're lazy, they work on whatever they want, want to instead of what the team wants them to, they mm-hmm. don't communicate. I see these hiring stories and yeah, a lot of them are private. I can't talk about all, all of them here, but I'll tell you some of the biggest brands come to us with these stories and they want a different way. Mm. That's why Amazon's done what it's done. You got to look behind the scenes, what's going on here. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. everyone has a narrative, right? Our oh, big company is oppressing their wage slaves. Great, great narrative. Now look at the other side, look at the local guys in the sweatpants. Half of them are stuffing around all day. Mm. You know, let's, everyone knows but they won't say it out loud that people slack off in remote work. Everyone knows. It. Yeah. Everyone knows examples in their network. They got friends they know are totally taking the piss. Mm. Yeah. Totally taking the piss. Yes, there's but this is a it, it's a, a very new thing, remote work. And there's a flip side to it. Flip side is you expose yourself to global talent. And so now you're your the actual thing is comparing Western remote workers to a global remote work is very different yeah. because when you're in a situation uh, as a, a lot of people are in the global south where you need to feed your family, there's, 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 actual, uh, there's, there's a lot at stake between getting, getting work done. The, the, the drive in these candidates are a lot different to the, to the West the West. It's, yeah. it's a very different, very different kind of location. 100%. Fish. Look, let's talk about these three things I want to talk about here. First of all, what you said there is so significant. If you want to work 100% at home, then you are also now a hundred percent part of the global talent market. There is no reason why I should hire an Australian as an Australian company, as opposed to an Indian in India. If you're going to be a hundred percent remote, you're both the same type of person. This is really important. The global economy is like that. Mm -hmm. Secondly, when you look at a place like India, India has a huge talent pool, but it's the elite best performers in that talent pool who put together the amazing teams that drive businesses. I, I know lots of examples. There's a one particular guy I know who had a startup, built an elite team over in Gujarat in India. And that team of software developers built an amazing product for him in like a third of the time compared to any other team he could have got anywhere in the world. But he had to find the best and put them together. There's a lot of people in India who are not gonna be able to do that job. And there are lots of horror stories of people trying to create these remote teams um, global teams and not being able to deliver products. This is a real problem for startups who don't have a technical co-founder. They don't have someone in the team They can build what they need to build. So they go out and they try to outsource it to an agency and 90% of the time it fails. Mm. Now these agencies, some of them rip off people too. You've got agencies who are selling Indian talent back to Australia, back to the US, and they have mediocre talent. They put them into some sort of shed somewhere. They pay them minimum wages, and then they take 50, 70, 80% margins and sell hourly rates back to Western companies. This yeah, needs crazy. to be called out. Yeah. It's not right. The way Polonize does it is right. We're doing it ourselves. We are building a team of elite Indian talent because only two to 5% get through the job simulation, prove their skills. They're the best, they're the champions. When you put them together, they are the best talent in the world. Mm. That is the best team in the world. Mm. Indian talent can compete at the top level. We now know that. 
And why would I hire a team in Australia that's going to cost me five times as much? It's not actually ethical to do that. If I hire that team, they're not going to perform at the right level. I'm not going to make the product, which is then going to serve my customers. It's actually wrong to do that. Yeah. Well, speaking of elite talent, since we're on the home stretch and got a couple minutes left, let's take a look at some of the top talent on the Polonize platform. Okay, so first of all, let's start with a recent hire on the platform for Aqualist, our Web3 company that's looking for, or Web3, that was looking for a Web3 marketing lead. Uh, Simon Zhang came to us last week uh, looking for a marketing lead, and we created this campaign for him. It had uh, three games in it, building a Web3 community, which was a communication game, a planning game, managing and marketing budgets, preparing for token launch, a strategic thinking game. Within about 48 hours, he had top six candidates, went through the process and hired uh, number two on the leaderboard, actually, Great. Mo Hibali, uh, which was an um, amazing outcome for him. So he's starting a, a month trial as of yesterday, I think. Amazing. So a great outcome. Yeah, and Web3 is, this is interesting because Web3, we know it can be difficult to hire great talent in Web3. Web3 is very particular. A lot of people like to stay a little bit anonymous. Mm -hmm. They use different platforms to do that. And so it doesn't have the visibility, you know, and um, we've seen it ourselves. We've spent time in Web3. We know it's hard to find good talent. No one's really doing it well, I don't think. The beauty of this is that you've now seen someone come through and they've proven that they can do that particular type of thing that Web3 marketing is, right? Mm. We know it's a different thing. It's not like normal marketing. Mm. You get a regular marketer who's never done crypto or Web3. They're going to struggle. So I love that you're seeing this template validated. Now, this template, Web3 marketing, we can roll this out, right? Because this every Web3 company needs this kind of thing, yeah. don't they? Yeah, exactly. And it, it, the interesting thing about this specific campaign is that Simon, uh, once Mo came through and he was about to interview him, he looked at his LinkedIn profile and he went, oh, I don't think he's a good fit. He doesn't have the Web3 experience. But once he spoke to him, he was like, ah, oh, Mo's yeah. genius. He's great. Yeah. So there is something that's getting lost in translation um, via those, just those, those static things these, like a resume, like a LinkedIn profile. We need to have a word static. for this, you know. Yeah. I, I think of these are like the unexpected champions mm. or the MVPs, mm. you know. Because this player is an MVP for the company mm -hmm. and that's why he or she got hired but would totally have been lost. Mm. So that's what Polonize is giving you. It's finding yeah. you that untapped talent. Exactly. And speaking of untapped talent and that same game, number one on that leaderboard was Tesla Map. We've spoken about Tesla Map before. She's, a particularly, she's of particular interest for me because she shows exactly that. An amazing talent from Nigeria. Uh, I interviewed her myself. The interesting thing was she actually missed the first interview because she had to take her best friend to the hospital because she contracted malaria. And so like these are hot, these are people that are that are in really uh, difficult circumstances that are just coming up onto the global platform because technology is getting to the space where they they can now compete. Uh, then they're now visible on on platforms. Tesla Matt's an absolute superstar. Yeah. Um, and she's she's even written a marketing strategy for us, which I didn't I didn't ask for. She did it off her own bat and it was, it was great. So there's so much of this talent and we're just scratching the surface, but this is talent that goes totally under the radar of most, 100%. nearly all companies. Yeah, look, let's talk about Nigeria for a second. Nigeria is going to be, I think, maybe the second biggest talent pool in the world after India in the 21st century. And he's gonna have a population larger than most of the major economies very soon, young population. Um, and they have a problem to solve on the macro level. These people are gonna need opportunities, right? So what you're seeing here with Tesla Matt is just one person. We scale that up to 10, 20, 30 million, and you're actually solving a global problem here. Uh, we know the talent's there. And like you said, Polonize is the only platform where they get the visibility and the ability to compete. And then you find the champions like this. Nothing is more satisfying, right, than finding great talent from a part of the world that's traditionally neglected. I think you posted something about this too. Did you have a bias against the candidates from Nigeria? Do you yeah. Think that was, that was one of my posts. I was thinking about, uh, after I spoke to her, I was analyzing my own uh, subconscious bias towards talent, especially that from India and Nigeria, because of the way they've interacted, talent or uh, workers from those countries have interacted with my life. So Nigeria being famous for email scams and things like that, In India being uh, synonymous with call centers and, and, and that type of thing. So there was a natural bias to think that, ah, just there was a natural thing in my head that scammers came from from Nigeria, yeah. and 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 pe people in call centers, uh, you know, most people look at them as as annoying or as scammers themselves, you know, because yeah. they're, they're selling something legitimate. But 
when I analyzed that, I realized that was a bias. And I also, I, it made me realize that the reason those things are happening is because these are a scrappy, uh, tough cultures and people that are trying their best to get, get onto the global scale, st stage, do the best they can for their community. And yes, there, there are scams in those countries. There are people doing whatever they can to survive. That's totally understandable. Happens in Australia and America as well. It's not like it doesn't, but it was just that natural bias I had that made me realize, wow, if that was, if that was me, what about the, the rest of the world? What about the, the yeah, rest of the- exactly. Industry? And you know, it's, it's actually, um, it, it, it's number one, pervasive. I had a hire just recently say to me about one of their players from India, oh, this is obviously scam. Mm. Why? I asked him, well, because surely an Indian can't write like that, you know? So in his mind, it was like, Indians can't communicate in English at that level. Weird bias, okay. We all have it and I have it too. It, it's actually a beautiful thing to be confronted by, there's only one way that a bias gets broken, not by people yelling at you from diversity and inclusion departments and beating you over the head and telling you you're a bad person. That's not how you change people's minds. You just need to meet someone like Tesla Matt and look at the experience you've gone through. Mm. That's broken your bias because you've seen a living example in front of you of talent. 100%. That's how you fix this bias problem. You don't fix it by yelling at people, by putting in policies, by you know government um, programs. Mm. I mean, look, th those things might have a have a place, but they're all secondary. Mm. And uh, you know, diversity, equality, and inclusion has got the wrong end of the stick right now. Mm. They're top down. They're looking at outcomes instead of opportunity, and. Uh, they're doing more harm than good, frankly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what, what it comes down to is finding the great talent. Just that can give everyone, look, this is sport, right? Equal opportunity, highly unequal outcomes. Mm. That's, a, that, that, that's the way sport works and that is the way that evolution works. That's mm. the way nature works, that's actually. True. Everyone gets a go, but mm. you know. Yeah, you have to perform. You have to perform. Yeah. And uh, you can be against that, you're against evolution, you're against nature. Good luck with that. Mm. Yeah, exactly. The, the, the diversity card is an interesting one that we speak about uh, for that very reason. You can't naturally have perfect diversity in every industry. You can't replicate and say, okay, this is what we look at as diversity and then copy and paste that to every industry. It doesn't work like that. No, it's just, yeah. look, it's all backwards, isn't it? Mm. Um, they're looking at outcomes rather than opportunity. Mm. Uh, Look, most people talk diversity. We're doing it. Mm. Now look at our look at our leaderboards. Look at yeah. who's coming through. Yeah, hundred percent diversity. We're just creating great jobs for for people, especially young people, all over the world. Yeah, we don't need to prove anything to anyone. No, we just keep happening. doing that. Yeah. And on that note, I think that's just hit an hour. It's been a great chat. We've covered a lot of ground. Thanks, Mars. Let's leave it there, and we'll see you next time on the Polonized Podcast. See you next week.